the struggle was was very very long and very very arduous but at some point i came to the realization that maybe everybody didn't struggle the way i did and maybe i could help some people who were still struggling if we are waiting until these people are adults to deal with it or are we waiting for some other situation to happen that brings their suicidality to the real surface where someone might recognize it we're waiting too long it's not rocket science it really isn't that hard but you have to get past the thing that the thought that you might say the wrong thing i mean that's the one thing that stops people from saying anything they're terrified they'll make it worse compassion can't make things worse get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast these are the tales of two hygienists one east coast rdh and one west coast guy genist listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm now please join michelle strange and andrew johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode number 185. My name is Andrew. And this is Michelle. What's up? You know, um, Lacey, our lovely little admin, RDH, that helps us out. I like how you say little and then she like bench presses you, but whatever. Go ahead. She, I, I want to be one. as strong as Lacey one day. But she uh, won a saddle stool at Did. ADHA. Mm-hmm. And I saw her using it on Facebook the other day. And I am, that is like the one thing that I don't have and I want. I don't know why I haven't gotten it yet. Like I get everything else. You probably just don't have enough contacts in in this life to get things that you want. Who do I need to talk to? We need to to do some some sponsoring of this here podcast. This here podcast. Just put a saddle stool under my behind. That would be great. That's all we need. That's all we need. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I feel like, you know, I feel like that's a good thing. We have saddle stools at, at work. I, I'm a stander. I, we've talked about this before, but I stand all the time. And so I feel okay not using it, but it is, it, at first it was kind of wonky and weird, but I feel a lot more comfortable using them now whenever I'm just hanging out or whatever. So yeah, you bring up a good point because the reason I was thinking about it was because I, I, I'm seeing patients still after my surgery. You know, so I'm so able to like do things, but like reaching and like, you know how sometimes you have to like dig in your heels and move yourself around. I was doing that and I was not feeling all that wonderful and I probably shouldn't be doing it just yet. And I was like, man, I wonder if I had a saddle stool where I was actually like propped up a little bit, but honestly, until then I should just stand and see patients. Possibly. I don't know why that doesn't like trigger in my mind to actually like stand up and see a patient. Have you done it before in your career? I have. Does, I have, it feel, well, does it feel awkward for you? Time. Um, well, I used to stand to assist, so I'm used to that, but I actually stand up to get to certain, to access certain teeth a lot of times, but I don't start and stop. Like it's all only for like a moment and then I sit back down. But I need to probably do that until I'm fully healed. You know, I've never really, um, I've always been happy to be six foot one, but there's a couple of different times when I have not enjoyed it. One is taking pictures at ADHA and Hardy Center One Roof with all you five foot three people that are there. <laughs> um, and I feel like a freaking giant. Other than that, um, at work sometimes, like they're, you know, some of the older chairs versus some of the newer chairs, some of them don't go quite up high enough. And so if I can't get them to scoot up in the chair and do all the things that I need to do to be comfortable, then I can definitely see that how that could be an issue. But I feel like you should be able to raise the chair up high enough and then get them situated so it's not too uncomfortable for you. And at least maybe every other patient or something like that. Yeah, I think that's that's my plan. Um, and we had a really great podcast way back when with Cindy Purdy that talked about that. So if you guys haven't um, heard that one, go check it out because it was very informative as Cindy's lectures and presentations always are. She's amazing. Yeah, and they just had a really another good, speaking of ADHA again, another good Teledentistry, Teledentistry presentation, lecture, yeah, yeah. presentation or whatever with, with, it was awesome. with Edie. So before we get into this amazing episode that we have, uh, we have one more week left on the promo code from Zerk. We talked to get about it a couple of weeks ago. So Zerk is offering a five plus one. So when you purchase five of any one particular product, you get one free. And so that's on all of their 
their products. So if you like the B lock trays, if you want to do some organizational things for your for your op- operatory, if you like cassettes, we talked a lot about some of the isolation things that they have. They have so many variables that you can choose from. It's a five plus one. You have to use the code tail five. The number five, T-A-L-E, the number five. Use it before July 31st, y'all. Get you some, get you some organizational trays. Man, I love those trays. So we have this episode where this really, Randy Jensen came on the show. She is someone who regularly speaks on suicide prevention. She has some amazing stories. She has some great coping skills, some great wisdom to impart for us. It has a little bit of a different feel to this episode. It's kind of like the child abuse one where, you know what, look, these ones are a little bit heavier, but I think that, you know, we got some really great response on the child abuse one. I think that you guys are really going to enjoy this one as well. And it's really going to help complete or not really complete, but add to our series that we were tackling this month, kind of about those outlier courses. This isn't perio, it's not cariology. It's sometimes these courses that are going to be required by certain states, but not one that is always on our radar. So we really do hope that you're gathering information, you're learning how to speak with your patient, learning how to identify some issues that your patients might be struggling with so that you can get them help, the help that they need that's not just a profi. Hey, Michelle. Yeah? It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So we're really excited to have our guest, Randy Jensen, on the podcast. And we're going to be talking about maybe a little bit of a sensitive subject, but one that is now being required by many states, and that is going to be suicide prevention. So thank you for taking the time and coming on the podcast, Randy. You bet. It's my pleasure and my honor to be asked to be on. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Oh, well, thank you. So let's tell us a little bit about you and who you are, what you're doing, and how you got into this topic. Well, um, this is a really um, hmm, very complicated answer, but I'll start off with saying that I've had several careers in my life, and uh, the current career is probably my mission for the rest of my life. I was uh, suicidal from age 8 to age 32, and I didn't realize that everybody didn't fight for their life every day like I did. The struggle was was very, very long and very, very arduous. But at some point, I came to the realization that maybe everybody didn't struggle the way I did. And maybe I could help some people who were still struggling. So I started doing some research and then I started realizing, okay, um, why are people coming to me asking me these questions? Because I was a flight attendant for 22 years. And during that time, the oddest things were happening to me. People would come to me, absolute strangers, on the airplane and off, and ask the question, um, could, you, could you talk to me? And then they would start talking about their struggle with suicidality. Now, I didn't know, did I have some kind of a label across my forehead? What was the aura around me that allowed people to think that they could talk to me? But I've always been a rather affable person, and I've got a rather ebullient personality. So I figured, well, all right, I would sit down and I would talk to people about about their struggles. And after a while, I decided I had to quit flying and start working on a counseling career because it's apparently what I was supposed to be doing. So I started getting, uh, at first I got my substance abuse certification and then I got um, a mental health uh, counselor's license and continued to go to school. But then at a certain point, I began to realize that I needed to start teaching as people weren't getting one-on-one. They just simply, it, the message wasn't getting out. So I decided I started teaching. So I started teaching at several different universities and um, I was teaching mostly, um, well, I was teaching mostly um, mental health counselors. And that continued on. And then I, when I was counseling individuals, it seemed to me that most of my patients were suicidal. And they had been suicidal most of their lives. And I thought, why, why am I seeing so many people who are saying they're suicidal? Well, I started thinking, well, maybe I should write a book about how I 
managed to survive my own suicidality and how I manage on an ongoing basis to to live with the neural pathway in my head, in my brain. And so I wrote the book and I published it in 2012. At that point, a friend of mine said, why don't you come and teach uh, through my training, continuing education program? So I've been teaching through Cascadia training here in Seattle, and we teach in several different areas in Washington state. And so I've been teaching the suicide prevention course there. Then in 2012, the Matt Adler um, referendum for the Washington legislature was passed that all health care providers in the state of Washington must go through some degree, they, and they defined which degree of suicide prevention training they needed to have. So some had doctors and mental health providers, psychologists and such, had to have six hours of training. Some of them only one time, but some also have to have recurrent training. So this kept going on, and then all of a sudden, I decided, well, maybe I should be providing the three-hour training for individuals who who work in in other areas of, of uh, health care. And that included dental hygienists and dentists. So I developed the program. I got it passed by the Department of Health, and I'm on the model list now. And um, so Washington uh, Association of Dental Hygienists called and said, would I start doing these trainings? Well, the first thing I discovered was dental hygienists in general were terrified that they were mandated to do this. How in the world would a dental hygienist have any way of having the knowledge to even follow up with someone who might say they're suicidal? And so I started talking to a couple of you guys and found out that, like me, some of you have had patients for eons. Some of you have had patients for 20, 30 years. And I thought, my goodness, you've, you've seen them go through marriages and kids and divorces and deaths and, and, and serious illnesses. And my gosh, you probably have more of a span of time with these individuals than anybody. And then I thought, I never even thought about the fact that because you're so close in proximity, you're in people's mouths. You can't be closer to someone than be in their mouth. And you're talking to them and you're seeing, boy, we're seeing some serious teeth breaking and grinding and what's going on in your life that's causing this. And, and then I started realizing that you have the input from people that other healthcare providers don't really have. You, I've had, when I broke two of my back teeth, this was during some of my really serious uh, suicidality days where I was just struggling every day to stay alive. And my dental hygienist said, what's going on? What's happening in your life? And I, gosh, I just blurted it out. I just told her. And she, she just said, well, I'm telling you this. I, I don't want you to do that. I don't know really how to help you, but... I just telling you right now that you can't do this. You just can't do this. And that's the first time that anyone ever said to me, I don't want you to kill yourself. And I had no idea that that particular statement could be so powerful. And that's the message that I wanted to give dental hygienists, dentists, and everybody else who thinks they have no power or they have no influence. Just being yourself and being with individuals and and knowing them and having to well watch them during some really struggles in their lives when they have a really hard time so you guys really have a um what should i say sort of a magnifying glass on everything because you can see it in their teeth you can see what's going on in their lives by looking at their teeth that's amazing to me and I've talked to a couple of de dental hygienists who said, yeah, I can see what is periodontal disease. You know, what does that really mean? Well, these people don't care about taking care of their teeth. That one of my patients who said, you're going to go talk to dental hygienists and dentists. And I said, yeah. And she said, would you tell them my story? 
I said, oh, boy, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and because uh, I certainly not going to breach any confidentiality. But she said, no, I want you to tell. I want you to tell. Oh, oh OK, well, all um, right. Tell me what you want me to tell. And she said, well, at the worst time in my life, when I was having the hardest time trying to stay alive, and she admitted she had been trying to, she'd been dealing and trying to deal with her suicidality for a good 30 years. She said that she was at the dentist and the dentist said to her, you have got to start flossing. You are going to lose all of your teeth. I'm going to end up having to put, you know, either false teeth in, I'm going to have to, I mean, you have to start flossing and brushing your teeth. You have to start taking care of them. And she looked up and she said, I don't care. And he, you know, he was sitting on that stool and he rolled the stool around and he put his hand on her, on her arm and said, I know I've been there. That's all he said. And she said it completely turned her around. She had never had anyone say anything like that to her. That's all he said. He didn't say anything else. He didn't refer her to anybody. He just said, I, you know, I know what you're talking about. And um, that, she said, I don't know what happened, but I just started flossing and, and cleaning my teeth. And she said, it changed my entire outlook on things. You know, she still struggles with suicidality, but she takes care of her teeth, you know. <laughs> so that means she has some futuristic attitude. She does know that somewhere inside of her, there is a deep and uh, abiding light that needs to be kept going. She knows that. So. I thought, you know, the dental hygienist, my job would be to remove that fear that they'd say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Because once you, once you share your empathy and your compassion, you can't say the wrong thing after that. Because that people reach out going, am I going to get slapped down again? Am I going to get told you're selfish, you're foolish, you're ignorant, you're going to go to hell, you know, all these things that they hear, and instead they hear compassion and empathy, it turns them around immediately, it spins them on a dime. So that's the message that I've, that I've got to give uh, dental hygienists. You've used a term a couple of times now, and I'm, I'm hope, hoping maybe we can get a, uh, maybe a definition, but suicidality is not something that we hear a lot. The term suicidality was coined by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, I think in 2009, I think. They defined it as any aspects of suicide, which meant suicidal ideation, which is thoughts of suicide, plans for suicide, warnings about suicide, attempts at suicide, and actually death by suicide. It's an all-encompassing term that just means all about suicide. Is there a form of chronic versus acute suicidality? Like, is this something that, like you said, you suffered from that for many years versus somebody that might just have a one-off experience where they're experiencing that? Right. I'm probably the only, only trainer who talks about three different types of suicide. There's obviously the situational suicide, which... Um, happens when you have either some hormonal upset or some situation in your life that just rocks you to the core. Um, it could be information about a terminal illness. It could be a, a death in the family. It could be a loss of a relationship. Those kinds of things are totally situational. Uh, a good example would be um, antepartum or postpartum uh, depression. A lot of women deal with this, a tremendous amount of women. As a matter of fact, I think it's like 24% of women who have just had children or are getting ready to have a baby have felt this uh, experience. And it's, it's very shaming. They don't want to share it with anybody because it's just, it's just horribly shaming. And um, what they've discovered is that it, it goes that suicidality and that feeling of like, I don't want to take care of my baby. I don't want to live. I don't want to live with the shame. 
it's very situational and that when they get treatment with usually an antidepressant and and most probably the most important thing is is social support. They get into a grief group or they get into a antepartum, postpartum group of other women who feel the same way. And suddenly they are not the pariah. They are not the one person who's feeling this way. They start getting support from other people and they start feeling normal again. So that is situational suicidality. That usually lasts for a very discreet amount of time. And if it's handled correctly, it probably won't come back. And then there's also psychotic, um, there's a suicidality that's involved with psychosis. And that's a, where a situation has uh, delusions and hallucinations that drive them to think that life is not worth living. And usually that is, it usually has to be taken care of with pharmacology and a psychiatrist intervention. That's something that I'm not really qualified to deal with. But the type of suicidality that I see most prevalently is chronic suicidality and that is suicidality with a chronic course and it's usually begun the basis starts in trauma in childhood or adolescence so that means if we are waiting until these people are adults to deal with it are we waiting for some other situation to happen that brings their suicidality to the real surface where someone might recognize it we're waiting too long we're waiting way too long we need to be dealing with the 1% of suicides that are children. That's children under the age of 12. We're losing our children. That is beyond horrible. I can't even think of a word that is horrible enough to describe losing a child to that. Is there a time from when the trauma occurs until the suicide preoccupation thoughts between that that time, how do we intervene? How, well, are there signs and symptoms that we can see to help them earlier? Yes, I, I definitely believe there are. If if we listen, that the problem is we're not listening. And I, I'll give you a good example. Um, the Native Americans in this country and other countries too are suffering from a horrendous rate of suicide, and it's happening mostly uh, in the younger uh, adolescent years. And I asked one of the, I was up at the Lummi uh, Reservation up near the Canadian border, and I asked one of the youngsters there, I said, do you have any idea why your compatriots, your friends, are, are killing themselves at such a, such a high rate? And he said, yeah. And I, whoa, boy, what is it? He said, nobody's listening. I said, really? You know, so tell me more. And he said, well, we tell people and they just shame us into quiet. We just can't say it. We can't talk to anybody because nobody wants to hear it. And that's that's fairly common. I hate to tell you that, but it is fairly common. And I'll tell you why. Because there is such a thing as the conspiracy of denial. And the conspiracy of denial simply comes from loving someone and caring so much about them that you cannot bear the thought that they would want to kill themselves or that they could be so sad or so depressed or in so much pain that they would want to leave this world. You, you just can't comprehend it. You can't hold it. Your, your, your ego or your psyche cannot hold it. You just say, oh, well, that can't be true. It can't be true. And I've had individuals say to me, well, my son has told me that um, he doesn't know why he doesn't want to live. He just doesn't want to live. And she said, well, he quit talking about it, so it's probably not a problem, right? I said, no, no, he reached out to you, and he didn't get the response he wanted. So he's, he's learned you're not the person to talk to about it. But that doesn't mean he wouldn't reach out to somebody else and talk to somebody else about it. So when kids say things, we need to be paying attention. We have got to understand that if they're hurting really badly, they're gonna they're not gonna say, uh, gee, um, you know, can we can we talk about suicide? No. What they will do is um like I had a fellow take his son camping, and his son just uh, said one night and they were bedded down, he just looked at his dad and he said, Dad, you don't have to worry about me ever killing myself. And 
the father said, well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm just really glad to hear that. And so I ask you, is that a subject that you would normally be brought up over Beans and Franks? I mean, is it really? Well, no, it isn't what his son was trying to say. Daddy, please talk to me about this. I don't know how to start the conversation. I don't know how to say the words. Please say them for me. Start the conversation for me. And and, and the father was so happy to hear that, that he didn't think beyond what would be bringing up this subject. And this happens over and over. I hear this from parents all the time. Did I miss an opportunity? And I, I usually say, yeah, you did. But the opportunity is still there. You can still go and talk to them. Go now and do it. And that's not just parents. I actually had a psychologist in one of my classes say to me, well, um, my patient brought up last spring that she was feeling suicidal, um, but she hasn't talked about it then. Should I just wait until she brings it up again? And I was in absolute awe that that question was asked. I thought, you mean you have to ask me that question? I am so sorry, but yes, go to her immediately and open the subject again and let her talk about it. We have a lot of things. We're, we're missing our kids in so many ways. We're just 1% of all suicides are kids. Mm -hmm. Now we've got to listen to them, that's all. We've got to hear beyond the initial words. So here, so just so you know. So what are some of these opportunities that, I mean, other than the obvious, like, I wouldn't want you to die or I wouldn't want you to kill yourself. I enjoy you as my patient. And are there any other things that we really just need to be on the lookout for? I think what you're saying as far as like, if somebody brings up, like, I would never kill myself. Like, well, that's, that's not a normal conversation or something that I would necessarily say. So that that's actually interesting. I wouldn't have gone that route or is there anything else that we can just be really in tune and listening for people reach out in all kinds of different ways and we're we're expecting somebody to come and tap us on the shoulder and say i want to talk to you about how suicidal i am but they don't do that they say things in all kinds of different ways they reach out in, in many different ways and um, they say metaphorical things like we are in um, my business. We talk about doorknob disclosures. And that is that when people are getting ready to leave the session, they'll say something very cryptic. They'll have their fingers and their hands on the doorknob and it's turning. And then they'll say something like, well, I may not ever come back. And you go, whoa, wait a minute. What's that about? Come back in here. Sit down. What's that about? You'd say something to them like, okay, we'll see you next week, same time, same station. And um, they might say something like, maybe, maybe not. Some people would say, well, oh, no, let's make it a maybe. Uh, let's make it a do, absolute, and, and let that fly. But maybe, maybe not is a very metaphorical statement of maybe I'll be alive and maybe I won't. It's just that we're not thinking that way. We're, we don't want to think that way. So we don't. I can think of uh, innumerable ex, uh, examples of how people have reached out and, and individuals have just totally missed it. But here's one way. Here's one way they do that. They'll ask you about, well, what did you think about Robin Williams um, and his suicide? What, what, and what did you think about Anthony Bourdain and, and Kate Spade? What, what do you think about that? And they'll wait for your answer. And if you say something like, I think it's incredibly selfish what they did. I think that they didn't understand and they, they didn't know that so many people depend on them. And look at, they all had kids. I mean, really, that's, that's unforgivable. Well, now that person knows you will never be someone they'll reach out to. You'll never be someone they'll go to for help. You will not be on the list. Because you have already shamed and blamed them because what you don't know is what they were really saying. What if I told you I was suicidal? So that leads me to the question of, I guess, some sensitivity training on our part. So definitely being a little sensitive in our answers, um, something very much like that. 
what other things could we say to a patient that would shut them down or not help them find the, the help and support that they need? Well, just by saying something judgmental like that, like like saying uh, something like, oh, don't you think that suicide is incredibly selfish? And they obviously don't know that suicidality is anguishing. It's tormenting. It, you cannot believe uh, what it's like to, to go through that. And on a daily basis, sometimes it undulates over time where it gets really, really at a crisis stage. And then it can it can kind of ebb and flow over time. But you're never free of it. You're never, ever free of it. And an individual who would say something judgmental about suicidality would immediately shut someone down. One of the dental hygienists uh, mentioned to me that she was at a restaurant and she went into the ladies' room, and there was another lady in there, and she had a beautiful dress on. She made a comment to her, and she said, well, I just, I love your dress. It's beautiful. And uh, the woman turned to her and said, it's a, the last dress I'll ever buy. And she said, well, why, why, would you, why would you say that? And she said, because I'm planning to kill myself. And she just said, Oh, no, I don't want you to do that. Is there someone I can call for you? Is there something I can do for you? And just that just that couple words of empathy, it turned that lady around. She didn't take her anywhere. She didn't give her anything. She just said those words and asked her the question beyond. You know, you say a cryptic thing like it's the last dress I'll ever buy. Well, if you don't ask a question about that, concerned about that, that shows a person you don't care. You, you don't care about what they have to say. So they would just walk out and continue on their way. How should we approach or how should the discussion go if we have a patient that has attempted suicide? Well, I will tell you this, that almost anyone who admits suicidality probably has already attempted it. So whether they're actually willing to tell you at that point that they have attempted it or not is, I mean, that is really a lot of trust they're putting in you to say that because they don't say it to shock you. They just say it because that's their way of reaching out. And if you find one of your patients who has had um, or is willing to say, okay, well, I've actually tried to kill myself at that point. I think I, whatever is in your heart is what you say. You say, well, um, you know, I, here's just an example. If, if I was a dental hygienist and that was something that patient said to me, I would say, I am so sorry that you were in that much pain that you would do that. Are you still in that much pain? Are you still struggling? Because if you are, there are people that could help you if you'd be willing to go and talk to them. That right there is a screening and a referral right there. That's it in one sentence. And you don't have to get out a piece of paper and go down all these particular questions to know that, okay, this person, ask them if they would like help. Ask them if they're still in that kind of pain and if they'd like help. And then make sure that your office has some kind of connections with mental health providers in that area so that you could call that person up and say, can you take a new patient? Uh, or could you see this patient? Uh, what kind of insurance do you take? Could you take this patient? It, all it would take is your office manager to do some searching around in your area and find a mental health provider that has openings who would be willing to take these these patients on a, on a pretty emergent basis. I think that's what I would do if I was a dental hygienist and I was put up with this. Now, that's saying that I don't really know your environment. You know, I can't really say, okay, this is exactly what would happen. But what I ask a dental hygienist to do is just to be open-minded and not terrified when someone says something like that to you and not to have your finger poised over the 911 button because if they have trusted you enough to say that, they're going to be willing to answer to what you, listen to what you have to say. And if you say, well, I have a couple of people that I think that if we called them, you could probably get in to see them pretty quickly. Would you be willing to do that? And then what I would ask them is, would you be willing to allow me to um, 
either text you or call you and ask you if you made that connection. And that, that kind of would be it. You know, that's, it's not rocket science. It really isn't that hard, but it, you have to get past the thing that the thought that um, you might say the wrong thing. I mean, that's the one thing that stops people from saying anything. They're terrified. They'll make it worse. Compassion can't make things worse. Are there resources that we could go and read more um, and have available for these situations? I'll tell you what. I mean, when I do these courses, what I really do is I tell people, um, yes, you can get all of the warning signs and the risks off of any website, the Suicide Prevention Association, um, American Association of Suicidologists, you know, the Department of Health. You can keep there's tons and tons of websites that you can go to and get all of these these warning signs. But you're going to be in a position where like you would be asking someone, well, I'm just guessing. OK, I please don't hear me say that I would have any knowledge, deep knowledge of, of dental hygiene, okay? I don't want you to think that because I certainly do not. But um, if I was in that position, I would just make sure that that I understood that suicidality, a person could be struggling with suicidality their entire life. And they may make attempts, but generally, um, if they're telling you about how they're feeling, the chances of them actually feeling like they want to do it at that moment is pretty low. That what they're reaching out is for someone to to give them some intervention. And um, this business about people saying that um, nobody reached out or, or that that's simply not true. Everybody reaches out, but not everybody catches the metaphorical reach out. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of places that you can go. What I want you to understand, though, and what I want the listeners to understand is if you go strictly by those risk and warning signs and those those risk factors, if you go only by those, you're going to miss about 90 percent of the people who are chronically suicidal because they will be like I was. I was happy go lucky. I was devil may care. I was just the opposite of all of those things on those websites. But what I said didn't go with the way I acted. I'll give you a good example. I went back to my 10-year class reunion, and at that point, I saw my old girlfriend from high school. We were buddies, and I saw her, and I did a talk. Um, actually, I, I just did a short little kind of comedy thing for the, the reunion, and then I asked my friend, I said, do you think anybody in the audience was guess that two weeks ago I tried to kill myself? And she, she just, what, what, how am I, what are you talking about? And I said, yes, I just got out of the psych ward. And she goes, well, what, how, how could you be so, you, how, could, what, how, I, but, uh, and she just couldn't believe it. And I said, that's, a, that is what most people who are chronically suicidal, that's what we can do. We can compartmentalize so long as we're out in public. But when we come home, we become what we call slam clickers. And that is a door, the door slams and the lock clicks. And there we are with ourselves and our, and our deep and darkest self. So you can't go strictly by those warning signs. And those risk factors, the risk factors are, are probably there, but none of those risk factors really fit me. The only thing that I had was I had a sexual abuse trauma in my history. The difficulty there was nobody knew about it. So how are they going to do? I mean, how are they going to be able to check that off on the list? You have to go you know, just your sense of compassion and understanding and knowing that people will reach out metaphorically, not absolutely in those words, but metaphorically, listening beyond the words and seeing the person reaching out. That's the difference. Just heightening your awareness that they could be saying something besides what they look like. Man, this is a powerful podcast. <laughs> so is there any, again, sensitivities that we need to be aware of? If let's say if we have a patient whose spouse or loved one child 
actually committed suicide. I, I think I think when you say like making sure that we aren't saying like well, how selfish, I can't believe they would do that. But I would just like to confirm that there are there are not terms and words and phrases that could really trigger or make the situation that much worse for for anyone in this situation. I think people think that grief is different from suicide as it is from any other death. It isn't. Grief is just grief. I mean, you can have um, you can have feelings of um, blame and shame from any death experience in your family or in your in your field of influence. You can have that. A lot of families are they're afraid that someone will say, how come you didn't see that? How come you didn't know that? How come you didn't take steps? Uh, how come, how come, how come? And it's it's very, very um, ignorant to say those things because like me, I acted entirely different than my inner atmosphere. My inner atmosphere was exactly opposite of my outer visage. And so it isn't hard to be close to someone and not know that they're struggling. If you are open and you say, uh, if someone dies from suicide in someone's family, you say the same thing that you would say otherwise. You would say, I'm so sorry for your loss. It must be a very difficult time for you. Could I bring you over some dinner? Could I bring you over? I, by the way, I know it's hard for you to do anything, but could I, could I mow your lawn for you? Could I do anything for you? And just do what you would do normally when someone is in the, in the, the difficulty of grief. Just be there for them. Uh, because mostly when individuals, families, when they are struggling with an aftermath of a suicide, they have enough to deal with internally. Because I had a friend die by suicide. I talk about her in, in my book. And by the way, my book is called Just Because You're Suicidal Doesn't Mean You're Crazy. And that's simply because everybody assumes that just because you're suicidal, you have to be mentally ill. And you don't. You don't have to. But I talked about her and the fact that um, when, she, when, she, when she passed over from suicide, I went over every single conversation we'd probably ever had. And over and over and over it in my head. And did I say something? Could I? Say, even though I know what I know about suicide, I still went through all the machinations, all the thought processes that you would go through trying to figure out could I possibly have said something untoward? Could I have said something mean or, or nasty? Of course, I didn't, but I mean, I, you go over it and over it again. So just knowing that that's normal and making sure that people understand that death by suicide is death. Grief is grief. And, and, and trying to stay away because you're afraid you'll say the wrong thing. Just go and say words of compassion like you would if there's a death from any any course of, of action whatsoever. You just go and you say, I'm so sorry. I brought dinner for you. You can put it in the freezer. And I noticed that your, your edging on your lawn needs to be done. Could I possibly do that for you? Because you and I probably have been through serious, serious grief in our lives. And we know we're just paralyzed by it. You can't think, did I pay the bills? I couldn't remember. Did I pay the bills? Did I deposit my check? Uh, you you just can't think. You can't think. You can't know what to do. And the things that people can do for you are the things they should be doing for you, cooking and cleaning and, and lawn work and whatever that they can do. There's nothing different. Nothing different by death by suicide. It's all the same grief. Randy, I wanted to ask a little bit about kind of suicide rates, it seems like it's more prevalent now than it's ever been. I mean, this is one of the reasons why we're having these types of discussions now and mandating these types of courses. Is there some sort of agreement to the reason for the increased rates? This is a matter of conjecture, great conjecture. People spend a lot of time trying to guess and try try to do um, questionnaires and and studies and research trying to figure this out. And a lot of people have a lot of suggestions about it. I watched Johnny Carson's show. 
I watch a lot of those old shows on Decades Channel, you know, because I firmly believe in in that old uh, saying, G-I-G-O. Are you guys old enough to know what that means? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you are. Okay, Michelle, you told on yourself. G-I-G-O means I'm not. I'm too young and youthful to know what that means, Michelle. Oh, my darling, Andrew, you're so young. You. <laughs> it means garbage in, garbage out. And it's the, one of the very first terms that came out through when technology first started burgeoning on the market, right? So um, G-I-G-O means garbage in, garbage out. And that I use that with my patients all the time. What is going in your brain? And if you're not paying attention to what's going in your brain, you will get out just exactly what you put in. If you put in CSI and NCIS and and um, unsolved murders and unsolved mysteries and and all of the abhorrent, nasty, ugly things in life, and you keep stacking that in your brain, what are you going to get out? Depression, you know, anxiety, uh, it, all of that. So. The bottom line was I was watching Johnny Carson's show, and this was from like the late 70s. And there was a person on there who said, we have got to do something about the suicide rates. They are skyrocketing. They're going through the roof. And he says, we have got to start paying attention. And he talked about the incredible uh, rate of suicide at that point. And I'm going, God, this is 40 45 years later, we're still having the same discussion, the same exact discussion. What is wrong here? What are we not getting? And what I, I would simply say to you is that our treatment for, for uh, suicide hasn't changed any since the 70s. When I tell people in my classes Look, if the first thing you do is ask your patient to write down all the things, all the reasons they have to stay alive, what you're doing is putting another nail in their coffin each time you ask them to do that. Because what you don't know is those things don't mean anything to them and they don't know why and it causes incredible shame and guilt in them. And so what you've done is heaped more shame and guilt on them. What is the very first thing that they have you do when you go to a psych ward? Let's write down all the reasons you have to stay alive. Let's make sure we have those right in your forebrain. So what they're really saying is, let's make sure that you keep in your mind how guilty and shameful you are and how horrible you are that this doesn't make a difference to you. My patient came out of a psych ward, and he said to me, the very first thing that was said to me was, how dare you do this to your children? And he said, the two weeks I spent in there, I didn't, I didn't get anything because I was just overwhelmed with shame because I knew everybody in there felt, thought that I was a complete dirtbag, that I could do this. He, had, you know, he just said it was horrible. So nothing has changed. So that could be one of the reasons why suicide continues to, to you know, it's a juggernaut. It just keeps going and going because we haven't learned anything. And what I've been trying to get across to people is that we cannot keep doing the same things and expecting different results. I'm sorry, but that is the exact definition of insanity. So we've got to start doing things differently. And that is we've got to start understanding that the majority of people that deal with suicide are dealing with it on a chronic basis. And they've come from a history of trauma that has never been resolved, never even been acknowledged or even validated. But certainly mine wasn't. And uh, when I was raped at 18, I mean, my family didn't, they, their way of dealing with that was not talking about it. We just won't discuss it. And I never got any help for it. I mean, it just continued like that. And, uh, and, and a lot of people don't have overt uh, abuse in their family. But we have to understand that abuse and trauma is relative. You can have a sensitive child who can have something happen to them and have a traumatic reaction when another child is very resilient. We have no real understanding of that. But what we have to do is say, how did this happen for you? How was it for you? Tell me and not make judgments about it. So to answer your question, uh, Andrew, 
there is many, it's a many pronged situation, but what we're not doing is anything different. What we're trying to, what I'm trying to do now is get people to understand that there are three different kinds of suicide and all of them need to be treated in different ways. You can't put a Band-Aid over all of them and say, okay, it's going to fix everything. Just does it doesn't work. And you know what? Washington State has got a higher rate of suicide than the entire nation. We're not doing too good. And get a load of this. We wanted to lower the suicide rate by 2020, and we're going the opposite direction. Opposite direction. And what I ask you is this. When you make your goal to lower suicide, that automatically makes some suicides acceptable. Understand what I'm saying? So that means, okay, if we're just shooting for a 10% reduction in suicide, that means the other ones are okay. We're going to get by with those, all right? So who are, those, who are they going to be? Your, your wife, your husband, your mother, your father, your cousin, your aunt, your uncle, who, your neighbor, your best friend. Who is that going to be? Because if we don't shoot for zero suicides and say, no, we want to eradicate suicide, we have to stop this. We're losing good people. It's just egregious. That's a true statement. Yeah, it is. It is. My mission, you know, is, is to, to stop suicide. But I'm 72 years old. You know, I haven't got a whole lot of time left. I got to get on the ball. You know, I really got to get going. And I know that our time is almost up. Well, I think this is was a really great closing statement, honestly. And we would love to let people know where they can find your courses and learn more from you. And if they have any questions, how could they reach out to you? Uh, they can go to my website. It's JSP3, the number three, dot org. So it's Jensen Suicide Prevention, the number three, dot org, JSP3.org. And you could just send me an email from there. And it has a list of some of the courses I teach. I teach, I teach you can contact me. Anybody can contact me. I'd be happy to uh, contract and go and talk wherever it is because I desperately need to get this information out to the general public. I have people coming to my classes for mental health providers saying, can I come in and just listen? And I, I said, well, this course is directed towards counselors. So a, a lot of it, well, you won't understand. And I don't want you to go away with misunderstandings. But I desperately want to find some venue to be able to talk to um, the public about it and, and to talk to them at length about it so that they feel confident that any words of compassion and empathy could turn somebody around and that you don't have to be a mental health provider. You don't have to be a psychiatrist and you don't necessarily need a pill. You don't necessarily need an antidepressant. You just need somebody who cares enough to say, I care and I don't want you to do this. Well, we have a lot of our listeners who work with the different organizations that put on events and courses and things like that. So I really, hopefully that some of them will reach out to you and, and we can help spread this message. Great. And you have some way to let your de dental hygienists know about the the course I'm teaching, the DOH course I'm teaching in, in let's see, there's one in Linwood coming up in September and one and you're one in Vancouver in September. Do you have a way to let them know that? We can put it on the wet, on the um, on social media and stuff. Do you want me to just e email it to you? Yeah. If... Well, actually, it's on the it's on the Washington website, the Washington uh, Dental Hygienist Website Association. So it's on there. But I can I give you this specific information and certainly um, invite them to um, invite me anywhere. The YWCA, I mean, YMCA down in, oh, YWCA, well, that goes back a few years. Um, the YMCA uh, down in Tacoma invited me to talk, but they're only going to give me 15 minutes. And that was just enough time to create a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little knowledge here could do a lot of damage. So I uh, declined, but um no, I would appreciate that, Andrew and Michelle. I thank you so much for giving me this venue. And hopefully 
I can reduce the anxiety of the dental hygienist and the dentist too, because my course qualifies for dentists also. So I hope I can reduce their anxiety about this mandate from the Department of Health. I think you will. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. We appreciate your work. You bet. God bless you too. Thank you. Keep up your good work. We enjoy it. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. So I do, that was, you did message me during when you're like, you look like you're done with it. And I was like, it's just, it's like you're, you're, you're there. You've hit the wall. Yeah. And it was, it's not even that, that like I was still taking it all in, but man, it was heavy and it it just kind of gets your head spinning. And it almost, I take, I go back to like, has my patient ever said anything like, thing like that to me? Have I said something like that to somebody? Because I have had a patient who, whose son has who committed suicide. And I'm like, what did I say? Hopefully it was sensitive. Hopefully I've never made anybody feel shamed for that thought. You know, I, so it was just a lot, but such great information. We really do appreciate her taking the time to go through her journey and how she has taken the things that she's had to deal with in her life. And now she's teaching and educating others. Like it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, and that's what it is. It's about the tools. And and her message right now is to all of us hygienists. She doesn't want us to feel that way. She doesn't want us to, to be nervous or scared or feel like we can't have those conversations. So if you guys are looking for a speaker for any of your events, make sure you guys reach out to her. Uh, she's fantastic. She's a great communicator. She has some great, she has way more stories than we had time for on the podcast um, and a lot, a lot more educational tools for us. So make sure you give her a, a shout out whenever you guys are ready for that. Yep. And this, I think, wait, what is this one? We're going to be at almost at RDH under one roof. This one. Yeah. Next week, next week, we are going to be at RDH under one roof. So come out and see us. Yes. Um, if you know, find us on Instagram, direct message us, send us a message, uh, via our email, either Michelle or Andrew at a tale to hygienist.com. We want to know if you're going to be there, what you're going to be doing. Um, come find us, say hi. If you see us on the show floor, give Andrew a hug. We'd love that. (laughs) The week after, um, RDH under one roof, we're leaving for Australia also. So the IFDH, the International Dental Hygiene Symposium, is not till the 15th and 16th, I think, of August. But we're going to be there, and we're going to be doing some live recording. We're going to be doing some interviews and things like that. So if you are there, any of our international audience, please contact us, email us, and let us know that you'll be there, and we will find a way to meet up with you. Sweet. Um, what else do we have coming up? We have um, also kind of later on in the schedule, September is ADA, right? In San Francisco. Yes. Yeah. And that's going to be like a trifecta meeting. So that's going to be FDI, which is an international dental conference, ADA and CDA, California Dental Association North meeting. So all three associations are coming together. It's going to be a big meeting. And then we have Zero World. Hold on. Before that, Verona. Hold on. Before we, yeah, you forgot about this already, we have Toronto, too. Don't forget. Oh, We're I going to no, Toronto. Yeah, I have forgotten. So I'll put it on my calendar. So that's going to be the weekend of the 14th. We're going to head there for a couple of days. Um, we're going to try and do at least one episode. We have a lot of friends up that way. So we're going to try to do that. Then in October is Dense Place Toronto World in Vegas. And then we have New York with uh, Tony's course. Uh, You may or may not be going, but that's at the end of October, October 24th, 25th, I believe. Tony Stephanie has a course called Beyond the Operatory. And um, it's, it's a course that's mostly about business. Him and Teresa Duncan. Yeah, he and Teresa Duncan have this course that they they put on together. So I'm going to go to that. I know one of our dental assistants from my office is going to go to that. Uh, my wife is actually going to go on that trip too. So if we're hanging out and you guys want to see Allison, um, let us know. We'll try if you're going to be in New York at that time. Let us know. I'm sure she loves that. I'm sure she absolutely wants to hang out with a bunch of dental people. <laughs> and then uh, November we have Greater New York at the end of November, and I think that's our calendar, everyone. <laughs> For at oh least the God. rest of this year. I just didn't want why people I to don't that, do this. It gives me anxiety. I know. I know. And that's only like a fraction of what she had, you have to travel for. Oh, God. <laughs> but anyways, we'll be at all of those places. So if you guys want to meet up with us, let us know. Well, we hope you have an awesome week and we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all.